Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. When you're an NFL player and you're disgruntled and upset about your situation and the current team that you're on, you have a few options of getting out. You can play out your contract and then hit free agency. You can hold out and just refuse to play again. You can fake an injury. You can cause a scene and try and force the front office's hands. But perhaps the riskiest play of them all is the intentional sabotage. You intentionally play poorly and not try in the hopes that your team lets you go. There are many reasons why this option can backfire spectacularly if done poorly. You increase the possibility of getting injured significantly if you play at half speed. If you make it obvious that you're dogging it, you'll get fined and suspended. Not only will the media and fans look unfavorably on you, but I'm not sure if you'll find another line of work, because other teams will either genuinely think that you're not that good anymore, or will not want to bring on a locker room cancer that stops trying whenever he doesn't get his way. However, if you play your cards right, you fool everyone, and still get what you want at the end of the day, then you're golden. It's a bold strategy, Cotton, but for one player, it actually worked out tremendously. In 1984, wide receiver Butch Johnson was unhappy with the Houston Oilers, and successfully worked his way off the team to his preferred destination. This is the story behind Butch Johnson and the most successful intentional sabotage in NFL history. Before I talk about the actual incident, we need some context as to just who Butch Johnson was in the first place. Our story begins in 1976, when the Dallas Cowboys spent their third round pick on the UC Riverside receiver. Dallas needed some help with the position, as it didn't really have any depth. In the regular season, of the players on the 1975 Cowboys listed at wide receiver, a grand total of two of them caught passes, with those guys being Drew Pearson and Golden Richards. The game was evolving into a more passer-friendly league. In 1973, coincidentally, teams averaged 1,973 yards per season through the air. By 1975, that number jumped up by over 300 additional yards to 2,279. Dallas needed receiver help, because things were not going to be easy with just two guys especially if one of them got hurt. They took Butch Johnson for that reason. They needed the depth. And while he served as the backup for a long period of time, along with being the team's primary punt returner for a few years, he got his times to shine. He was one of the unsung heroes of those great Cowboys teams from the late 70s. He had a fourth quarter touchdown against the San Francisco 49ers in 1977 that practically put the game out of reach. It gave Dallas the number one seed and home field advantage in the NFC. He had a 35-yard touchdown in the 1980 Divisional against the Los Angeles Rams to cap off a 21-point third quarter and seal the deal and send the Cowboys to the NFC Championship. But if you remember Butch Johnson for one play and one play only, it's probably this one right here. Super Bowl 12 against the Denver Broncos. He scored an acrobatic 45-yard touchdown to give the Cowboys a 20-3 lead in the second half and pretty much put the game out of reach. Yes, this was a catch back in 1977. No, there is no way that is a catch by today's standards. Regardless, that touchdown was the moment it was all but official that the Cowboys were going to win their second title in franchise history. It seemed like everything was going great with Johnson in Dallas. He was a quality depth option who could make some insane acrobatic catches. Former Cowboys offensive coordinator Dan Reeves said that Johnson had better concentration in catching the ball than any receiver he'd ever seen. And keep in mind, that Super Bowl catch, full extension and all, was made while he was playing with a broken thumb. However, once the mid-1980s rolled around, everything soured quickly. By the time 1983 came along, let's just say Johnson and head coach Tom Landry were not on good terms at all. Johnson was already pretty upset that he was not going to be a starter. Even though he had the talent, and even though he was making good impact off the bench, he wanted to play a lot more. Now 29 years old, Johnson had been the number three receiver for seven years, and wanted that to change. He could never overtake Drew Pearson on the depth chart, couldn't overtake Golden Richards on the depth chart, and couldn't overtake Tony Hill on the depth chart. And if that wasn't upsetting enough, Landry was about to implement a change that may have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Because if you know anything about Johnson besides that Super Bowl catch, it's probably his iconic touchdown celebration known as the California Quake. He did this after practically every touchdown. Whereas the icky shuffle closed the 80s in touchdown celebrations, the California Quake began the decade in style. During this celebration, he would simulate the act of pulling guns out of holsters, then would shoot them and shake. It was his iconic celebration. And in 1983, Landry decided that Johnson wasn't going to be doing that anymore. He banned all end zone celebrations, including the California Quake. 
Landry said, they didn't tap dance in the end zone during my playing days, and I'm not going to tolerate it now. He then added, I just want to do away with all distractions. Part of that may have been to try and act more professional, especially in the wake of losing three straight NFC championships. Part of that may have been because of an incident that happened after Johnson did the dance in a 1982 game against the Eagles, and then didn't celebrate with Tony Hill and Drew Pearson. In a snub so bad that Hill almost considered requesting a trade after the game and called Johnson out, saying that he didn't know what kind of an ego trip he was on. Just like that, the celebration was canned. And things didn't get better as the 1983 season went on. After Hill got injured in a game and Doug Donnelly replaced him in the starting lineup instead of Johnson, Johnson left the team for a few days to go to Mexico. Johnson clashed with Landry and his teammates a lot due to his outspoken nature, and even went as far as saying that the Cowboys were not that good in the early 80s and that he was the most exciting thing that the Cowboys had during that time. Even though Johnson had a career best year in 1983, posting 41 receptions for 561 yards, the damage was done. He wanted out. And when the Houston Oilers traded for him, things got even crazier. When the 1983 season was over, Johnson wanted out, and Landry knew it. There was no way the two could coexist with each other anymore, especially after eight years. One week after the Cowboys lost to the Rams in the wildcard round, Johnson and Landry met and agreed to go their separate ways. Landry said that they planned to trade Johnson, and if no trade partner could be found, that he'd be granted his release. There were two locations that Johnson had in mind. One of them was the Los Angeles Raiders, which makes sense, as he was born in LA and went to high school and college in California. Plus, the Raiders were the defending Super Bowl champion. The other one, and his most preferred destination by the looks of it, was the Denver Broncos. There's a few reasons for this. Perhaps the main one was that the head coach of the Broncos was Dan Reeves, who was the offensive coordinator in Dallas when Johnson was starting out down there. Johnson knew Reeves' offense. And as mentioned earlier, we know just how much Reeves raved about Johnson's talent and abilities. Combine that with Rick Upchurch, the team's starting receiver from 1983, retiring after the season due to injuries and not wanting to risk damage to his spinal cord, and Johnson knew that if he went to Denver, he would easily be in the starting lineup. Plus, you had John Elway, who everyone knew was going to be something special. There was nothing not to love about Denver. Landry said flat out that he would call up Denver and offer something up. From the looks of it, Johnson was going to be a Denver Bronco. Instead, Landry did a 180 and decided to trade him to the Houston Oilers. The Oilers had won a combined three games in the previous two seasons. They had a brand new coach in Hugh Campbell who had never played or coached in the NFL before. And Johnson did not want to be there. He felt that he was flat out lied to by Landry. As Johnson said, he said he put my request under consideration. You can see how much consideration he put it under. When Johnson got traded for Mike Renfro, he began devising a plan to immediately get out. And with that, when he showed up to Houston, he began to intentionally stink. He didn't want to look like he was blatantly dogging it, but he wanted to look expendable more than anything else. Apparently, in the meeting between Landry and Johnson, Johnson was upfront about his intentions, saying if you trade me any place besides Denver or Los Angeles, I'll get traded. And true to his words, that's exactly what happened. Johnson played three preseason games with the Oilers and caught a grand total of zero passes. And by the end of the preseason, Johnson was traded to the Denver Broncos. The mission was successful. And it makes this article on the trade absolutely hilarious in hindsight. One Oilers spokesman said that Johnson appeared down over the trade like he was genuinely upset. Johnson expressed disappointment, saying, I was just getting to know the Oilers. That's just the way it goes, I guess. But with that, eight months later, Johnson got his wish to play in Denver. And three months later, Johnson would shock everyone and tell the world of this plan. In the middle of November, well into the season, Johnson spoke with the press and told the world that he's the greatest actor of all time. He admitted to purposely playing terrible and described his time in Houston as a summer vacation job. Obviously, the Oilers didn't take too kindly to this. A lot of them were in disbelief at the news, with head coach Hugh Campbell saying if he was acting, he should be in Hollywood. Campbell and company genuinely believed that Johnson just didn't have it anymore. But was this acting? Or was it just a giant excuse to cover up for diminishing skills? Based on everything we know about Johnson and his personality, and based on the numbers he put up in 1984, amazingly enough, it's probably the former. This was acting. Because in 1984, Johnson had what amounted to, by far, the best year of his career. He had a career-high 42 receptions for 587 yards and 6 touchdowns. He scored a touchdown in two of his first three games, which is a far cry from the guy who couldn't catch a single pass in the preseason. He had an insane game against New England where he had 9 receptions for 156 yards and 2 touchdowns in a winning effort, and he was a big reason why John Elway improved a lot, 
and why the Broncos went 13-3 to clinch the AFC West that year. Unfortunately for Johnson, he got injured in 1985 and wouldn't play again after that season, as the Broncos released him during the 1986 offseason. But in 1984, Johnson had a career year, and it was all because of some of the greatest acting in NFL history. If you thought Jalen Ramsey mastered the art of how to get traded, think again, because Butch Johnson perfected it nearly 40 years ago. Johnson said that he would always have a bad taste in his mouth towards Hob Landry. Little did we know at the time that his final act of defiance would be as a member of the Houston Oilers. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and we cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.